let's try to stay within the lines here. Okay, well, wow. Uh, I'm Jim Surkamp, and I have with me Tom's, uh, Tom Clemens, one of the leading scholars of the Maryland campaign. That this, this to me, these series of volumes are the mother load of the, the, uh, the most complete, comprehensive uh, account of the Battle of Antietam. This Dennis Fry's most recent book is Antietam Shadows, which is sort of a, a distillation of many volumes. Well, let's just say first Joseph Harsh. This is a man who worked 50 years on this, starting with his PhD dissertation, who I believe, Tom, you worked with? You were, yes, your he, student? Was, he was my mentor. Your mentor. Uh, very important. This is another, uh, what is it, Antietam, oh, Taken at the Flood. Joseph Harsh, and now we have Tom, who has done uh, the Opus Opus. You can see all my dog-eared uh, pages in it. This is Tom taking the letters of Ezra Carman, another invaluable source, and then checking and rechecking and creating a, a really the, the last word on what happened, when, and to whom. Let's start off this way, Tom. Boom. For many, many years, this is something Dennis Fry talked about, and he has his own phrase, but we had three historians that have defined how um, the Maryland campaign is generally portrayed. True. Okay, Francis Palfrey. Yep. And then uh, uh, James Murfin, mm -hmm. gleaming bayonets in the 60s, and then the one that really brought attention to Antietam landscape turned red by Stephen Sears in the early 80s. The three men have set up and created a vast, a well-established well perception of the Maryland campaign as being uh, a, a kind of a carnival of George McClellan's mistakes. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and Lee, in some ironic way, becomes the most brilliant escapee. <laughs> It, it, it's all kind of turned around, but Dennis keeps saying that the record does not support that McClellan made a carnival of errors, that he actually forced Lee out of Maryland, and more, what is what over, very much overlooked is that Lee was targeting Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. okay, and, and that McClellan has a funny way of doing very important things bloodlessly and quietly. <laughs> He cut him off, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and then I'm, I'm going to give it over to you. But September 16th and the 9th, McClellan cut off Lee's uh, passage to the west, which would have taken him to, north to Pennsylvania. It might have been the most crucial thing he did, among the other things. But an example of an overlooked achievement. Uh, and, and the second thing we hit on was how ironic it was that McClellan, who politically was on the Democratic, non-Republican side of the spectrum, who favored uh, negotiation, did not support the idea of abolishing slavery. And so his success actually was uh, Lincoln and his Republican friends did sort of a judo trick on him and turned it into the, the ultimate basis for establishing the Emancipation Proclamation. And that's the irony, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, his success essentially enabled uh, Lincoln to do what politically McClellan didn't approve of. I think Dennis said that was the worst day of McClellan's life, but uh, those are what Dennis's thoughts are. Do you think that your writing, your research, uh, has brought new new insights that you think are contrary to those previous uh, perceptions? Well, sort of. I mean, I was mostly annotating and editing Carmen, so I didn't feel that I had the license to write my own book in the footnotes. But Carmen will, from time to time, make references to the idea that McClellan is pretty much a competent general and doing uh, good things. Uh, and so, you know, I would, I just had somebody last night tell me, they, they'd read the books and I said, I see we're in the insight, in, in, you know, the insights you put into the footnotes where you're really trying to restore McClellan's reputation to some extent. And I said, yeah, I, I'm not trying to do it for my purposes, but because Carmen says so, but yes. 
part of the problem that I see, and you and Dennis may have touched on this, but you know, the general public likes the the uh, capsulated version of history, and they want heroes and villains. Exactly. And so, to my mind, the two real American icons that come out of the Civil War are Abraham Lincoln and Robert E. Lee, both revered somehow down through American history. And when McClellan essentially argues with one and defeats the other, <laughs> that doesn't make sense. The icons are less iconic. That's right. Double so we jeopardy. Have to, yeah. So we have to essentially make McClellan wrong so that the icons can remain icons. And, and the shorthand that I like to use is that on September 3rd, 1862, McClellan is told to pull together a field army out of four different disparate armies that are pretty much defeated, demoralized, worn out. Losing streak. And yeah, and, and uh, demoralized I think is, is a good term because they're just, Second Manassas just was a huge morale blow to the country. And in four days he puts together an army. Then he's told with Lincoln's essentially acquiescence that he is to lead that army out. His two main goals are to defend Washington and Baltimore and to drive the Confederates from Maryland. And so in two weeks, he marches this polyglot army 70 miles, forces Lee to retreat from two different battles, captures 39 flags, 13 cannon, 6,000 prisoners, 12,000 small arms, loses none, and everybody talks about what an idiot McClellan is. <laughs> it, it's, almost a, it's almost a miracle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it is a very successful campaign. You know, Lee retreats from the Battle of South Mountain at night. Now, you've read a fair amount of Civil War history. Do you remember any army retreating no, from that, a battlefield at night? Isn't that what they call it, uh, uh, desperate decisions uh, based on desperate circumstances? Oh, clearly, yeah, clearly. He knew he had to get out that night. And, uh, you know, again at Antietam, he, you know, realizes that he just can't continue the Maryland campaign. He, uh, you know, and this is part of where I think the Battle of Shepherdstown Ford is so critical, is that that's truly the end of the Maryland campaign, that both generals leave Antietam with the idea that this is still ongoing. Lee is going to cross at Shepherdstown and swing back up into Maryland and cross at Williamsport and still go to Hagerstown in Pennsylvania. And it is McClellan's pursuit to the river and Lee's realization that his army is wrecked, that he abandons that decision. At, you know, on the 20th, basically, based on what happens at Shepherdstown Ford. Listening to Dennis, you realize you're talking about Shepherdstown. He said McClellan is keeping the pressure on everywhere. Yep. Way up in Williamsport, the pressure is always on. Yeah, he sends a good bit of the army up to Williamsport to deal with that, but at the same time he goes across the river and, and attempt to pursue Lee to basically say, you know, you're getting pressure from both sides. And it's the strength of the counterattack at Shepherdstown that convinces McClellan that Lee's army still has enough strength to be a factor. And so McClellan will do the same thing that Lee's doing. He will go to some place where he can rest and resupply his army, because that's what Lee's doing. He goes to Winchester mm -hmm. and is inactive for you know until November, uh, pretty much. And uh, you know both armies are worn out. They have been in constant motion, constant campaign and many battles since the spring of 62 and by September, October, they're simply worn out. Is, isn't it interesting how we forget fatigue yes. and disease and wounds and you know, we forget that that's actually central to everything. Well, exactly. I mean, it, it, you know, people have their own opinions about reenactors, but one of the great things about reenacting is you get the feeling of what those soldiers went through. You know, you get up and you march and you have to f find your own food, forage if you're not supplied, you, you know, uh, many miles in the heat and the dust or if it's raining in the mud and all those things. And you just realize that marching an army is not the same thing as pushing a little block on a flat map and saying, okay, we're going to go from here to there. Was it you in that early C-SPAN interview who said that you could calculate that 90 miles of walking I don't know, you know, there was some, Tony tried to do the march, estimate the marching, 
And then the 50,000 horses and mules. Oh, yeah. yeah. I know some orchardists who have been here for, since before the Civil War. It's Rellum Orchard in Carnesville. They said they switched from wheat after the Civil War to apples because the ground was so compacted. And one other thing. So you just said that McClellan's, uh, that strong counterattack by Lee kind of really clinched it for him. Yeah, they do. Maybe they really do have 100,000 men. But this is the thing that's almost a little, little funny. Things happen again and again and again, kind of in a fluky way, mm -hmm. chancy way, that always gave him more of that impression. What do I mean? Well, uh, you know, one of that the cavalry guy runs in and meets him in the marketplace and Frederick Kennedy sees the lost order. And I finally understood that it doesn't have the number of men on it. I heard that in your interview. That's what I, I missed. What he sees is Confederates to the front of me, to the back of me, to the right of me, to the left of me. Must be 100,000, right? Well, they're traveling in essentially unfriendly territory, and they've split their army. Uh, and he thinks that Lee is a good general, and he doesn't think he would do something that rash if he didn't have enough force to sustain himself. And I looked into this in, in volume one. I thought, okay, McClellan has this idea that Lee has a big army. Where did he get it? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Sears and everybody said, you know, they, they start to psychoanalyze, well, it's this problem he has. Well, generals don't essentially make up their own information. They, they gather it. Mm -hmm. uh, and in those days, without an intelligence branch, the generals became their own de facto intelligence officers. So I looked at who's telling him numbers. Mm -hmm. And the lowest number I found was 75,000 which came from General Wool in Baltimore, and how he came by that, I have no idea. But the upper end of this is Andrew Curtin, the governor of Pennsylvania, right. and he has these telegrams where, you know, Lee is in Frederick with 190,000 men, and there's more coming to join him. You know, so he gets these estimates from 75 to like 250,000, and everything in between. <laughs> There's a fellow named George Sharp who's going to start the Bureau of Military Intelligence, uh, and it's not up and running yet. By the spring of 63 it is, and Hooker uses him quite a bit, and what Sharp is doing is he is interviewing prisoners. Now there is some of that going on, but there isn't a systematized fashion of doing it, analyzing it, and getting it to the commanding general. So McClellan is, as I say, sort of acting as his own intelligence officer. Cavalry and civilians are his two main sources. Everybody talks about Pinkerton. Pinkerton has nothing to do with his campaign. Um, so, so we have that. He's trying to get his handle on reality. And he, once again, he sees this report. It could be a massive army, and Lee wouldn't be so foolish as to spread a tiny army around. Right. And what I think it is, is the release and arrival at Antietam from the Harper's Ferry contingents. Mm -hmm. What I'm getting at is McClaws lands on the battlefield just at the right moment mm -hmm. to confirm again to Lee that there's huge numbers of, you know, that contributes to that perception. Well, and look at through the day. I mean, there is this opportunity here in the West Woods in the morning. charging in there because there, there's no opposition. You know, uh, his corps commander, Sumner, rode out to the Hagerstown Pike. 
to the edge of the West Woods, and back, and nobody shot at him because the Confederates had all fallen back to the far side of the West Woods. So there's this opportunity. He sends a division in there, and you know, bam! Here comes McClaws. Here comes Early. Here comes Walker. And Sedgwick's division loses almost half their strength in, in 20 minutes. And he's another convert to a huge army. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, Sunken Road, you know, just when they think that they've got that, there is this Richard Anderson's division comes up, it's reinforced. And even A.P. Hill's arrival. And so it seems right. like throughout the day, every time that there's an opportunity, there is a Confederate counterattack. Lee pulls another division out of the hat. <laughs> and so it reinforces the idea that he is facing. I mean, to me, if you look at when McClellan arrives at the east bank of Sharpsburg, uh, he doesn't have the whole army with him. Because Franklin's Sixth Corps are still down at Crampton's Gap. Mm -hmm. And Couch's division is not even with Franklin. So McClellan arrives, he's got maybe 65,000 men, and he believes he's facing this army of over 100,000. I think it's a testament to McClellan's boldness that he even attacks, because he attacks what he believes is a this superior is where, army. South Mountain? Well, at Antietam. Yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Today, we as a public are, I think, much more aware of the problems that can happen with bad intelligence than we were, say, 20-some years ago. Okay. You guys talked about this on C-SPAN. Where do you put the lost order in this thing. Both of you said it's, it's been sort of blown out of proportion. How do you characterize it? And it could be pluses and minuses. Well, yeah, I actually have a little talk I've been doing for some Civil War roundtables about the lost order. And I think the first thing is you have to put it in context. Always, okay. Okay. Between August, mid-August of 62 and mid-September, there are five lost orders. <laughs> okay. In August of 62, Pope is threatening Central Virginia and threatening to move to Richmond with a large army. And Lee has sent Jackson up to confront it, and then he comes up and joins Jackson. On the 18th of August, Lee issued orders to Jackson and Stuart, and basically what they were going to do was they were going to flank march to the west and come around behind Pope and trap Pope's army between the Rappahannock and Rapidan rivers in Central Virginia and destroy it. And Jeb Stewart, his cavalry chief, uh, has these orders. His adjutant is carrying them in his dispatch satchel. And a little town in Virginia called Verdiersville, a ford had been left unguarded. Union cavalry come in. They nearly capture Stewart. He mm -hmm. jumps up and rides off without his plumed hat and his scarlet lined cape and all mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But his adjutant is captured. That dispatch is in his case. And so Pope gets that order the same day and says, wow. They're trying to trap me, and he immediately moves north of the Rappahannock River. Another lost order story. Exactly. But there's no battle, so nobody really writes about it very much because we like to study battle. So that's a but very would, important lost yeah. order that saves an army. And it's, you know, there's no question of authenticity. It's captured from a Confederate staff officer, and it's acted on immediately because it's that day. Now, a couple of days later, we know Jeb Stewart rides behind Pope's army, uh, the Catlett Station raid, 
and he captures Pope's headquarters, his dispatch book, and his book that has all the men in his army, what reinforcements he's expecting from where, and all that. And it's that captured information that allowed Lee to plan the second Manassas campaign and force Pope to fall back. So there's another captured captured order. order, and this one this one went somewhere. Yeah, yeah. This is basically what sets up. Now here's Jackson at Second Manassas, and not only Jackson but uh, D. H. Hill both will intercept couriers from Pope's army carrying orders. Jackson actually misinterprets it. But D.H. Hill understands what it is because Jackson was going to send D.H. Hill off to Centerville and he says, no, look at this order, you better keep me near. And that's what saves Jackson's wing on the first day of Second Manassas is again, two orders intercepted once again. So in other words, you've had a series of orders being exchanged. Now, when you get to lost order in the Maryland campaign, we know it's written on the 9th of September. We know the Confederates are moving out of Frederick on the 10th and by the 11th, D.H. Hill and the rear guard are leaving. The order's not found until the 13th. So uh, it's four days. History. It's yeah. history. Yeah, <laughs> it's old. And as you've pointed out a moment ago, no numbers attached. Jackson's command is going to go here. Well, what's Jackson's command? How would McClellan know? You know, what's Longstreet's command? Because they're not using core then, so he doesn't really know the order of battle. But just he, locations. Yeah. And so, it's old. Uh, he's got a lot of contradictory information. Lost order says that Jackson's going to cross the river at Sharpsburg. In fact, Jackson goes all the way to Williamsport and crosses the river. So, and McClellan is aware of activity in Williamsport. So he's saying, okay, here's what it says, but you know, there's Union cavalry in Westminster off to his flank and rear. Lost order says nothing about Lee going to Hagerstown, but he knows Lee is in Hagerstown. So obviously then this thing has got some contradictions. Uh, it has no numbers, and it's out of date. I recall you saying in that earlier interview that he was moving much more, with much more dispatch until he found the order. Well, there's a letter that Lee writes um, on the 16th, but he's describing the night of the 13th when he you know, uh, is aware that the Union Army is pursuing. And he, he writes a letter to Davis, and I love the phrase he used. He says, finding the Union Army advancing more rapidly than convenient. <laughs> <laughs> but even before McClellan is you know, convinced the lost order is genuine and trying to sort out mm -hmm. the contradictions, he's already sent the Ninth Corps into Middletown Valley. Mm -hmm. So he's already pushing troops forward even though he hasn't really fully digested or reacted to 191. Yeah, it's, in a way it slows him down because he says, okay, wait a minute, we've got to sort out all these contradictions, we've got to see what's really going on. Oh, that's interesting. Somewhere, someplace, I saw the report that the just a bare three hours after the last of the Confederate uh, uh, units crossed Antietam, uh, came across the first Federal, just a mere, mere three hours later. Oh, yeah. But it's, again, a refutation of uh, 18 hours of delay. The 18 hours of delay story is a myth that just needs to die. It, it just needs to have it a stake pounded in its heart, right? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, Got that? Yeah. Uh, you know, again, this because they don't see big movements, they assume nothing's happening. But the point I want to say is, on the 13th, when lost order is found, the Union Army is already in motion. Through this campaign, McClellan has been writing orders at night, distributing them to the various wing commanders for the march the next day. So on the 13th, they are already marching, responding to orders they received on the night of the 12th. They're not sitting in Frederick saying, which way did he go? They're yeah. marching. I mean, we like to think of McClellan as, as hesitant and slow and that sort of thing, but the reality is, as I say, he's already got troops going forward when he got lost order. The ninth, orders of the Ninth Corps had already been cut for that march that day. And if anything, it makes him stop and kind of reconsider. And, you know, he has the lost orders I think by early to mid-afternoon. I don't think he has them before noon. On which day? 13th of okay. September. And by 6 o'clock he's writing orders to Franklin about the attack at Crampton's Gap. And that's pretty quick. I've, I've been on the battlefield and on tours with professional military people. I asked them, hey, you've got this order intercepted and you know, within six hours or less you're cutting orders about how you're going to respond to it. And they all go, wow. 
that's pretty quick. You know. Dennis and I were saying that historians would do a carryover of previous perceptions of right. Lee and McClellan. Federal's losing streak or McClellan at the Peninsula campaign, Lee on a big winning streak, mm -hmm. hasn't lost anything yet. Mm -hmm. And that just they, they just reapplied that to Antietam even though it was different. Yes. And I think you know, Dennis doesn't come out and say it exactly in his book, but this is basically what Joe Harsh used to refer to as lazy historians. Yes, it's correct. That somebody else wrote this and so rather than go research it yourself, you say, oh, okay, well, that must be so, and then they put that into their book. And so it keeps getting repeated and repeated until it becomes, you know. We've got a word for this. You know when you get behind a big 18-wheeler? Yeah. <laughs> These are, they're drafting yeah. behind their previous historian. And, and, you know, Joe Harsh had no use for that at all. I mean, he went back and just to the original documents and the original, you know, material and worked from the ground up. And that was, you know, that was the way he worked. You know, now that we've, you've mentioned Joe Harsh, what is the research strategy? Joseph Harsh's real contribution was just really relying on the reports of the, t of the moment. Joe was the most thorough researcher I've ever known. And what he would do when he was working on these books because uh, it's a trilogy, as you know. He would take all of his sources, and he liked to work from official records and from first-hand sources that were contemporary, if at all possible. You know how that mm -hmm. goes. Mm -hmm. But he would photocopy all these and then snip out all the information day by day and post it on index cards and then it would assemble all the information that somebody might have been aware of on that day. So when Lee's making a decision in Frederick, Joe says, okay, here are the sources that he had available to him. This is what he knew that day. We can't read backwards and say, oh, okay, because we know what's going to happen. That's a huge point, isn't it? So he would just say, okay, here's the intelligence they had that day. Here's the decisions he made based on that intelligence. And just day by day, so the big card index files full of all these snippets glued to index cards of what they knew day by day because his his mantra was what did they know at the time and what decisions did they make based on what they knew. It must be very tricky to figure out what, oh, was it tricky to find out what did get into their brain? You know? Oh sure, sure, because you know Lee is not the most forthcoming in no. his and he didn't really write memoirs, you know, and so it's always, you always have to tease it out. But He's he, sort of sphinx-like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, you can, he wrote letters to Davis, and you can gain some insights there. Almost every day he wrote a letter to President Davis explaining what he was doing. Now, you get into some of the politics of that because he's always very respectful of Davis, but uh, like, you probably, again, arm's length. Yeah. When, when this campaign begins, Davis says, I want to come up there and be I with know, you. I know. Yeah. He's trying to move so fast that Davis can't stay up with him, and, right? And Lee really doesn't want him there. Does, does not want Does him. that sound right? He's, oh, yeah. He's, you know, he sends back Walter Taylor, his aide, and says, you know, tell him it's just much too dangerous. I'll it's call you later. Much, you know, you're not in good health. All these, you know. You can see Jefferson Davis is champing at the bit. Oh, yeah. He wanted to lead the victorious Confederate Army into Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Absolutely.